Hi, welcome to our Lenten Bible study, Jesus the Storyteller, Parables from the Gospel of Luke. I'm Joanne Stewart, um, pastor of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Webster, New York. And I'm Doug Stewart, pastor of Incarnate Word Lutheran Church in the city. What a great opportunity we have to bring our congregations together to study God's Word and to, uh, and to engage in some faith-building exercises. Yeah, I'm really excited about this. I'm excited to do some of the um, online things. This is the first time we're trying something like this. Um, you'll see these videos that will be posted each week along with a written um, description of the parable for the week. Um, and then there will also be some discussion questions. And we hope you'll be a part of those, that you will answer them online. Um, we, we're going to have a virtual classroom here and we're gonna invite you all to be a part of this, to answer some questions. And we hope we get into some wonderful discussions with each other. So first of all, what is a parable? So Doug, what's a parable? So I like to think of a parable as God's Trojan horse in our life. In other words, it's a story that has a deeper meaning to it. A story that gets inside of us and looks harmless on the surface, but then gets inside of us and we discover there's a lot more to uncover. It's mm -hmm. like I said, it's kind of like God's Trojan horse getting in, in our souls and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and opening us up for some new things, hopefully. Yeah. I mean, that's a great, that's a perfect analogy for a parable. I think of it, first of all, it's a story and it has a surface layer of a very wonderful story. It has a moral to it. It's kind of one of those stories where, all right, here's what's happening, go and do likewise. But then it's a little like an onion. So you peel away that first layer and you get to something a little bit deeper that might be, it might challenge us. It might make us think a little bit differently. Get a little deeper, it makes you think even differently until finally you're kind of looking at it. And I think parables can sometimes make us angry because they really force us to rethink things that we've thought about God, things we've thought about ourselves, things we've thought about our culture, about the church, basically about everything. It's a way of rearranging our theological furniture. So are you saying that as you peel away those layers of an onion, will a parable make you cry? <laughs> Well, you know, it was worth a shot there. So. Oh dear, I knew this would, doing this with you would bring these kinds of things yeah, together. There you go. But, but yeah, I think it, they can make us cry because they. I think sometimes parables actually do reveal maybe our own shortcomings, our own failures, our own just maybe wrong ways of looking at things. Um, and so they become challenging. And of course, in the first century, that's the way it was because it was the parables. Um, among other things, among other teachings of Jesus, but I think the parables really had a way of getting under people's skin and look what happened to Jesus. It's what got him nailed to a cross hmm. because they so angered people. So what you're saying is parables are by no means harmless moralistic stories. Exactly. I remember learning par about parables in Sunday school and they were just these wonderful little stories and everything. And I think that's a really good way to present them. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with presenting parables to kids. But they don't just remain in our childhood. I think there are stories that um, as we grow, these parables grow with us as we kind of dig into them more deeply. Makes so, sense. Yeah. So what's your favorite parable? Do you have a favorite? I've got a bunch, but I would have to say my favorite parable is the parable of the mustard seed. And not just because Incarnate Word has a mustard seed kitchen. Uh, no, my favorite is the parable of the mustard seed because it's a parable that, that talks about the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. And it seems so harmless and, and so, so, um, uh, it, it seems like it's not a threat at all. It's just this tiny, tiny little seed and it grows and we think, oh, how wonderful it grows and, and shouldn't our faith, like, faith life be like that as well? But there's a deeper level to that. And I love the fact that, that if you look deeply at mustard seed and you look at the, at the context uh, in which that was written about, 
folks didn't like mustard seed. That was not something that was harmless by any stretch of the imagination. It was a weed. It was a weed that was that was out of control, that farmers despised it, tried to get rid of it. It reminds me of the time I was doing my internship in North Carolina. Right around the time the state of North Carolina was introducing a, a, a vine called kudzu and it was designed to stop soil erosion which on the surface that's really a good thing we want to prevent soil erosion but the kudzu was so good at what it did it took over and it just it just took everything over and folks were struggling to keep it under control and they couldn't i think the mustard seed is like that it, it, and that it points then to the kingdom of god the kingdom of god isn't always something we want to be to, to have around us because we are challenged by that kingdom of God and so um, and it can't be stopped and maybe at times it feels like it's a weed in our life and it's overwhelming us um, but that's I don't think that's always a bad thing so we just had a bonus parable yeah, there we go. <laughs> so, wh now where's the mustard seed? That's in... That is actually in, in the Synoptic Gospels. It's in Mark chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 13 and Luke chapter 13. Okay. So those three Gospels each yeah. have a variation on the, uh, on the mustard mm -hmm. seed parable. That brings up another thought because there, there really are no parables in the Gospel of John. Um, John instead uses um, imagery like the I am the good shepherd, I am the vine, you are the branches, I am the living water. There really are no parables. But the reason we're working in Luke so much is because Luke's parables, he, Luke has almost as many parables just in, in that one gospel as Matthew and Mark combined. So mm. that's, it's kind of an interesting way of getting into the parables and seeing them in light of Luke's theology and how he uses them. And I think in, in light of Luke's theology, it makes sense there'd be a lot of parables, parables disrupting us. Mm -hmm. Because if you look way back at the beginning of Luke's gospel, we're told that God is turning the world upside down, mm -hmm. that God is coming to the marginalized, that God is lifting up the lowly, he's bringing down the mighty, he's turning our world upside down. I can't think of anything else other than parables that really do turn... Our, like you said earlier, our, our spiritual furniture upside down. It, it, our, our lives are, are, are changed and transformed by parables. Mm -hmm. So that there are so many in Luke does not surprise me in the least. Yeah. And just what you said there it reminds me of like, well, it's hard to pick a favorite parable for me. Um, since I'm the one who put the study together, I picked my favorites already, which is basically Luke 15. So we'll get to those in a few weeks. But um, one of my other favorite parables, actually, is the sower and the seeds. Mm. Um, because, again, it's like the mustard seed. Like you said, it's su on the surface, it sounds like such an easy, wonderful story about this wonderful, kindly gardener who goes out and takes a lot of seed and throws it around, and some of it... I guess it, it's like some of it takes, some of it grows roots and does wonderful things, and other of it just doesn't. And so the Sunday school version that I learned as a kid was, be the good soil, so that when the seeds are planted in you, you can, you know, that they will flourish. Amen. That's a good story. I mean, that's a good analogy. But when you start to really think about the parable, what crazy, insane... Uh, just nuts gardener would take that much seed and just cast it everywhere. I mean, this gardener is intentionally throwing it in places where it will never grow. He's throwing it on rocky soil. He's throwing it on the path where it has no chance to take root or anything like that. And when you start looking at it this way, you say, well, that makes no sense. Why would a gardener do that? Um, isn't there just, we, we have a cat who's trying to be in the video here. <laughs> um, why would a gardener do something like that? Why would you waste all that seed? Shouldn't we be much more careful? Shouldn't we be saving it? And shouldn't we save it for just the good soil? And all of a sudden it becomes another parable of the kingdom, but really of God's grace, that God has a limitless supply of seeds. Mm. In other words, God has a limitless supply of grace and love and compassion and mercy and forgiveness and all of those kinds of things. And I think, you know, when Jesus was telling this story in the first century, there was this belief that 
God only had a limited amount of love. And so you can't waste it on the outsiders. So you don't waste it on Gentiles. You don't waste it on sinners. You don't waste it on people who don't deserve it. But in this parable, we hear that that's not how God operates. Mm. He doesn't waste anything. He showers it on all of us. And then all of a sudden it challenges us to look at those people who maybe we wouldn't waste our time with and realize, wow, if God values those people enough to plant seeds and to shower grace on, we need to as well. Hmm. So they challenge us. They do. And that, that parable certainly challenges us in our conception of, of scarcity, mm -hmm. our conception of abundance. It, it, it completely um, turns that around on us. Mm -hmm. and that, that's incredible. Parables yeah. are just incredible for, for doing that to, our, to us. Yeah. yeah. So we hope that you will join us throughout this season of Lent as we dig into these parables. Um, you will find more stuff on the website here to, show you, to share with you, you know, how you can dig in a little more deeply. And we hope you'll join us next week as well. Um, there are some questions here. Please join us. Please answer some of those questions. And so thank you for being a part of this. This is yeah, great. Thank you. And thank I, you. I just, I just want to say one more thing, if I could add one more thing to this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, why parables and, and, and why Lent? Well, like we just talked about, parables are all about stopping us up. It's about making us stop in our tracks and really reassess everything. It, it, that's what it does. To me, it seems like the season of Lent is about that too. It's mm -hmm. about slowing us down. It's about stopping us in our tracks, ta allowing us to, to not take life for granted, not take our faith assumptions for granted. My own hope in, in, this, in this virtual Bible study, um, my hope is that, that we're all going to um, come out of this transformed, that we're gonna come out of this um, with a deeper appreciation, not only for parables, but especially for what those parables bring to us, a deeper sense of God enveloping every single fiber of our lives. Maybe Lent can do that for us with these parables. I hope so. So blessings to you on your Lenten journey, and we look forward to sharing it with you. God bless.